share of federal funding in Hawaii, there is an interstate system in Hawaii. Cool. Even an exit for Pennsylvania. Okay. We're recording, but we're not the broadcasting. Interstate in recording. We can't even go from one island to the next, much less from one state to the next. I thought, well, if this wasn't a graph or just, well, everybody else got their share of federal dollars for an interstate, we get one too. <laughs> you can go to, actually, because there's so much traffic on it, the traffic moves slower on the interstate than it does just on the street. So, in order to get to California from Hawaii, don't take the interstate. It's slow traffic. <laughs> All right, I think you're recording, correct? Okay, we're going to start back about the approval of the minutes. And Ms. Patty Hightower had a correction to the minutes. Oh, well, I had a Sorry. question, and Ms. Rogers was here, and she may, may be her to answer it. But um, if, as I recall from her um, information that she gave us uh, at our last meeting, uh, when you look under chair and vice chair elections, and it states that, that um, Chair was elected with a vote of eight, yes, zero, no, and one abstention. There were 10 of us here, and that does not add up to 10. So I think it needs to say nine. My presumption is everybody voted for it. Well, uh, Madam Chair, I accept that from the amendment. It's just a correction to the minutes. Yeah. Do we know? Any other, <coughs> other minutes, any other I move that we approve the minutes as amended. There's already a motion. Are you moving the amendment? I second that. Motion to approve the minutes. All in favor? Aye. 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 Um, next we have the approval of the bylaws of the Hawaii I see uh, the 
notice on some of the stuff from T. Escambia that the uh, mayor from Century was on the board of the T. Escambia. Uh, mayor Hawkins was also on our board from uh, the Healthy Start Coalition, and he drove the hour and 15 minutes from Century to Pensacola monthly, and that's one way is an hour and 15 minutes. How and why the gentleman did it is beyond me, but he did. But I'm just thinking of things as we expand to include our uh, constituents in North Tantoma, on up to Century, et cetera. We're talking about drive times of an hour and a half to two hours when they've got instant communication and participation available. Let me, that, 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 let me stop there. There's a great suggestion. So we are under sunshine law, which is a little bit different than other workers. And so we have to abide by the sunshine, the, the statute, the um, administrative code, and the attorney general kind of thing. I did talk to Ms. Rogers to, um, about this earlier today. Um, so the governor, back when the pandemic started, the governor suspended the regulation that you had to be present for all sunshine law meetings if you call in both via Zoom. He now, in, in November, he, he in fact said, he, 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 he suspended that emergency declaration and said you have to be present for sunshine meeting calls. So that's why, and Ms. Rogers is here today so she can clarify that, um, but you have to be present unless there's extraordinary circumstances <coughs> where you appear via Zoom. So it would be up to the board of the trust, the board of the trustee of the trust to determine what is an extraordinary circumstance if we're even allowed, we have to go by the wall because of sunshine. That makes sense. I'll let this Rogers verify. It does, but I'm, uh, again, I'm trying to think of inclusivity and cohesiveness and realities for asking people already to serve with no compensation, et cetera, et cetera. And thinking now of the Skanska Bridge fiasco, et cetera. All of those things coming together within our county, as our logo here shows, it's a long distance. If you make any trips to and from uh, Century with any regularity, and if there's any way that we could put a mileage parameter on it, perhaps, or something that allowed for the exception to uh, promote, as I say, inclusivity of an entity that exists to serve the citizens throughout the Scambia County. For your actual trust members, the ten appointed members, you're, it, it doesn't work. I don't think it's working. I'm not sure what to do about it. Um, so for the trust members, you're going to be obligated under the Sunshine Law to have a forum physically present at the meeting, convening together. You would then be able to vote at the request of one of your members who indicates they're unable to be present in person, but they are wanting to participate in the meeting, the board could make a determination that under extraordinary circumstances, as presented by this person, that they can be allowed to participate electronically. And if the board votes to allow that, then there has to be the ability in both directions to hear and be heard everything that happens. So it's possible to do it. I don't encourage it, but it, it is possible to do it. That's separate and apart from what you may want to allow for public participation. They are not going to be under that sunshine law obligation. So you can provide for some alternative avenues for participation from the public. That would be up to the board's discretion. I follow that uh, up with a question to someone, whether it would be yourself or someone. I just feel pretty strongly. I previously served as the Children's Medical Services Medical Director, which covered all 10 counties in the Panhandle, including those just south of the uh, Georgia border, etc. And those children up there and the families, I had responsibility for seeing that they got services just as much as the kid out here on North Ninth Avenue. And I see us, with particularly beginning, this Children's Trust that is to cover all of Scambia County, having just as much responsibility for inclusivity, representation, taxation, everywhere you want to go with it for those folks up there 
as we do the people that are sitting right here in front of them. And I would encourage us, and again, in this day and age of technology and whatever, to research that and to come back rather than, and I value your opinion, I don't want to uh, convey that by any means, but to be able to say we cannot do this because why? Or we can do this and become the regular portion as opposed to these others, as I said, at least three of the fact that we had specifically said, if you're not there, if you're not there. And in this day and age, I don't know these other places and the, the sizes of the counties, but I do know that Scandia County from Pensacola up to Century Point have made a long drive to have expectation that the representative that may be a formal member of this board eventually at some point in time is the one expected to make that drive. And when he doesn't, then it falls into the situation where we get here where you've had three absences and bang, you're off the board and all these bad things are going to happen, et cetera. And I just, I guess I lean towards how can we make it work rather than how can we. You know, I, I understand the, the concern. The board has some legislative discretion in making the determination of what's an extraordinary circumstance. Um, the easy ones would be obviously an infirmity and health challenge. COVID situation raised the specter of some additional uh, ideas about things that may make it an extraordinary circumstance for somebody with a um, situation, for example. Travel related is definitely something that would be something for the board to chew on and can make that decision. Well, um, if Madam Council, if, 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 if a member of the trust was represented via uh, uh, electronic, that would be a national Correct. Correct. In other words, if you meet all these criteria, physical form, present, extraordinary circumstances founded, here and be heard in both directions, that person is allowed to participate in the meeting. And it's they, not they're considered present. They would be considered present. Correct. They would be a participant in the meeting. And from my counsel, I'd love to get your advice on going a little bit for this world. I don't know if the chair may request a member resign. I'm not clear. It's going to be a vote by the board, but they request that I resign. I'm not exactly sure. I'm not going to do that. And how do you divide on the exchange? Hopefully they won't do it out of the sunshine. Are you asking who makes that decision? Correct. We would, right? As a board, we were, we're the ones that would be tasked with if Dr. Northrop needed to not be here for whatever reason. Is that what you're asking? No, he and the question from Commissioner May was, what does it mean when it says that the chairman would ask a member to resign? Page six and seven, article nine. Um, oh, that has to do with absences, isn't that correct? Yes. We were discussing. Uh, and that's, I think, in all of the all of the um, other bylaws where you're. But again, it's at the discretion of the board. Um, you say three absences, but should you know? Should someone have you know, like for the summer, you know, you're gone and that kind of stuff. So. No, I mean, in fact, I don't agree with But it says the chair, the chair will request. It doesn't define that it will be voted by the board. And so, I think maybe maybe we define that. And so, I don't. Maybe some language that says excuse or unexcused or. Uh, right, so I'm hearing that you want to change that amend, amend in that part. Okay. Yeah, I'm, Would you like to I'm just going along with. Okay. Not, 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 not. Dr. Northrop was talking about you know, people being able to submit call in votes and via Zoom or you know, the board members call in. So you, you wanted to research that more, is that correct? Yes. Okay, yeah, so if you would like to research that and maybe bring that back to us the next meeting, would that something that you would like to do? I would like to remind everyone that they can be amended and, um, you know, at any time that, that you have an amendment. At this particular time, we don't have anyone sitting on the trust um, from Century. We are televised so people can participate. Um, and so I think that that would be something that we could ask somebody to do some research on uh, and make an amendment at that time if we felt like we needed to. If I could just say for the record, um, I believe this is my fifth meeting and I have to drive three hours to get here. So I think it's important, so I'm here. Yeah. And also, so I think anybody who's going to participate in the trust will have that same 
fraction. Yeah, I, I, I think there's another workaround too, is that we could find alternative locations if that became an issue, such as Molino Park Elementary School, um, where we could set up technology to live stream and so forth. So there, there could be some workarounds to this situation. Tommy, Madam Chair. Sorry, my neighbor. It's realistic that uh, JJ has a trial and wants everyone on the same day and has three consecutive uh, misses. And I don't know if that's extreme. Yeah, it said the chair may request. It didn't say show request. So and, and there's, like there's a difference between may and show. And, and we would have to vote. So, I mean, the only thing that I would say, I, mean, I don't think you can kick me off. But I, 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 yeah, I, I think that uh, the chair may recommend to
they're declared on violence. Okay, so we will be if we're not going to establish them, then we need to take them out. But it's more about should we remove them than should we add them somewhere else. I, I agree. I think we just missed that point because we discussed standing committees, right. but I think we, we forgot that they were listed. I, I forgot. I won't say we. I forgot as I was going through. I didn't catch I, that. I have no so. issue with having an executive committee that was just by the planning committee. I just want to make sure that by voting for them, we all know what we're doing. We're also voting that those are existing committees. We are, we, we are going to vote, as you see on the treasurer, a little bit, so that's part of the executive committee. And then one of my goals is to, is to have a budget for the committee. So we will be doing that hopefully tonight. So it's appropriate to leave them as they are? Yes, sir. Perfectly fine. Comments, questions, concerns? All right. So are you ready? Can we still on the recording? We have it. We have it approved. Yeah. Okay. 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 Okay.
However, if you look at tab six, and it was also in your agenda, it was hyperlinked for you, there are some children's trusts that have made it an obligation of membership of their trust that you do a proactive disclosure so that everybody knows where you're coming from. You can certainly agree that you want to obligate yourselves to, to do these sorts of disclosures and make them a part of your written record to be kept uh, as a public record for all to see. This is just an example, and you can also see under the subsequent tabs seven and eight, some of these children's trusts have made this type of thing. Uh, you can build it into your bylaws. I know you've voted on your bylaws. You don't have to make this a part of your bylaws. You can, by vote, simply say that you want to have a form like this where you all disclose who you're employed by, what nonprofits you serve on, those kinds of relationships you have in your day-to-day -day lives that might present long-standing issues so that the public will know where you're coming from. This is something totally separate apart in addition to your standing legal obligation with regards to voting conflicts. And we did talk about that a little bit at the last meeting, but it's under tab one in your, in your materials there in your binder. And this describes exactly when you would have a voting conflict. This needs to be considered for every agenda item on your agendas going forward. And these are very, very fact-specific determinations. You may not vote on anything that would inure to your special private gain or loss, the special private gain or loss of your relative, of your business associate, or a principal by whom you are retained, which I generally would say would be your employer, but it could be other things as well. These are extremely fact-specific determinations. And there's a very specific form. We actually had one uh, by the judge that was filled out from your last meeting. And it's in your backup materials here. Um, it's under tab eight, I think, maybe not. Um, anyway, it's, it's mem Memorandum of Voting Conflict Form 8B. Three, and I thank you. And I have given you also behind the form, I've given you a copy of one that was filled out by one of my former commissioners just to kind of give you an idea of what it looks like. It is absolutely necessary that you fill this form out and it needs to be made a part of the minutes. The sooner you realize you have a potential conflict, the better. I would highly recommend, when possible, to have the form filled out prior to the meeting, make it uh, available to your colleagues prior to the meeting when possible through either the attorney or the administrator, not directly. Um, and if you're not aware that there's an item on an agenda where you may have a conflict and you learn during the meeting you have a conflict, we need to get the form filled out as soon as possible. It has to be made a part of the record within 15 days. And if you are going to speak in any way about the item that you have the conflict on, you need to make sure that it's disclosed immediately to your members what your conflict is. This is an obligation. You have to do this, regardless of what you as a trust may or may not want to do in your bylaws, whatever. This, this is mandatory, and it does apply to each and every vote that you take if you have a conflict of interest. I think for purposes of, the, of this evening, the thing that Ms. Appiard was wanting you all to discuss is whether or not the board is interested in the use of and adopting a form similar to the one that's at tab six. This was what was hyperlinked in your materials for your agenda. Um, this is not mandatory under state law, but you as a trust may want to do this. I also say that these prohibitions on conflicts of interest could potentially be something that might disqualify you, for example, from service on this board. If you're going to have a long-standing and continual conflict, um, if you wish to do business with the trust for some reason, you also cannot serve on the trust. There may be things that would disqualify you. So if you have that sort of potential relationship or want to have a relationship, I would suggest that you get with me offline and let's talk it through because you don't want to get too far down the road and then realize that there's a problem like that. So I think for now, um, yes, Ms. Hightower.
I, I just want to, you know, sometimes um, we're, we we want to be sure, you know, like if you sit on a board of a group that might be applying, we get, we get nothing from that. We're not getting compensated. We're not a compensated board member. But, you know, I think that's one reason I looked at the, you know, I think about Impact 100 and the fact that we all have to disclose what boards we sit sure. on. Just so people know that if, if you're sitting on a committee and you're, you have some knowledge about that particular um, group. Um, but, but would you advise that you'd have to recuse yourself there because you're not really making money, but you just are sitting on that board? So that is an, it's a very interesting question because it's a little bit of a gray area. Just because it is a nonprofit or a charity does not necessarily mean that you do not have a conflict of interest and it may not mean that you you may or may not have a voting conflict as well. Just because it's nonprofit, just because you're unpaid, does not mean that there's not a conflict there. Very, very fact-specific determinations. I would say the most concerning thing would be is if you are a board member or a deciding policymaker or a treasurer of a nonprofit and you're in a situation where you may be potentially asking for and or receiving funds from the board that you sit on here. That can raise some, some concerns and some questions. So if you find that you're in that kind of situation, let's get in a offline somewhere and have a one-on-one -on -one and walk it through. Uh, it may or may not disqualify you from either voting and or potentially even being on one or the other of those positions. Just a comment to that. Um, to me and my experience with these, it's all about the transparency and the visual that comes from the public to that issue. Um, as we've all learned in Sarbanes-Oxley, there's a lot of governance issues with boards that create fiduciary responsibilities. Even though you may not be a paid member, you still may have liability issues as a board member. And there is a direct connection between the funding made available to an organization and that, and that organization's financial position. And that could be easily extrapolated by the public to say that there is a conflict just because you simply, because you sit on the board. So I would always view it from the public's view and it's very easy to see how those kinds of things would be best to opt out from that kind of a vote and just say, I need to recuse myself from that particular vote, turn in a form, identify the self, yourself as a board member, and that way it's completely transparent and you don't, the conflict can never be raised at that point. True, but it is also, just to make sure I'm crystal clear, there are some relationships that a voting abstention will not resolve. There are, you, there are some relationships alone that cannot exist. You cannot for example, sell your services to the trust and also serve on the trust. I mean, that's just a basic example. Yeah, and I, but, I think you raised the idea of the intent to do future business also. Correct. Uh, is a very environment, like for example, I'm retiring in two years. So if I know in two years I'm gonna go work for a nonprofit in Pensacola that's gonna make a lot of money off the trust, I need to be talking about that now and excuse myself from the trust because that's in my planning for the future. So that would be something that as a board member you would need to know and disclose as soon as that item came up. And Allison, with that, I mean, I couldn't come off the county commission uh, and go and work for someone that's receiving funding. Isn't there a dead for, period that I gotta wait so, multiple years before I can go work for an organization that receives funds? So can, yes, there, for a, you cannot, as the elected official, go back and lobby for money before your own board for two years. Right. Yeah. Um, so I think the question for this evening was whether or not you wish to adopt some sort of form for the sake, really, I think of transparency for the record, for the public, and for each other, something that looks like this at, at tab six. Yeah. I and else, I mean, there's no way that those of us, I mean, I serve on at least five children boards. I mean, so there's no way, I mean, but as long as I disclose and I'm not getting anything out of it, um, I can say I, I'm not going to vote on it, correct? Well, this is what Ms. Hightower was talking about. So 
usually, yes, that is true usually, but there are sometimes going to be relationships that cannot coexist together. So it may mean that you would need to pick one or the other. Usually when you start talking about charities, the first question is, well, are you just a member or are you like one of the deciding policymakers? Are you the, pres the chairman, the president? Are you the treasurer? Are you, what, what's, your, what's your role? Um, and then ju just because it's a charity doesn't necessarily mean that it's okay to do it. We, we really want to walk through it and analyze it and see what your role is with that charity and but like we do at the county, I mean, if I voted for community action, Doug's out there, and I'm sure he's going to apply for money, we would get an opinion of the Commission on Ethics, correct? Right. So it may require that we – I may advise, well, that's a really unique situation. Let's get an opinion from the Commission on Ethics. We can certainly do that. I have good, I have good results getting on the phone with them even if we just want a, a quick and easy answer, or maybe it's more convoluted and we can ask for a written opinion. Um, sometimes when you have public entities, especially like a community action and the Board of County Commissioners, that's an easy example. They have unity of purpose. It's common a commissioner serves on that board. And there are a number of boards like that. Um, the PEDC, for example, the state law says that you're going to have a couple county commissioners on that board, so you're obligated. And just because the BCC may be giving money to the PEDC, that's not necessarily a problem because state law says that relationship must exist. So they're all very fact specific. So to that end, I, I, I really do urge you early and often to look at your agendas, what's on the agenda. If you see something that looks familiar, look in the backup. I mean, get being prepared is the number one easiest way to help stay out of trouble. And um, I, well, know. the best advice you and Ginger ever gave is just full disclosure. Full disclosure. Yeah. And and when in doubt, I I usually do advise to to abstain from voting and fill out the voting conflict memo. I've seen a lot of people get caught. <laughs> by the Commission on Ethics for not abstaining. I've never seen somebody get in trouble for abstaining. So that's, that's a good rule to, to live with. <laughs> it's, it's true. Hi, Madam Chair, ma'am. I just want to share a thought that I have about this, and thank you for that information. Very helpful. I think we, we look at ourselves as a board, but we also look at ourselves as a board 10 years or how many ever year, number of years down the road, and people will come and go off of this board. I, I would be in favor of having a, a statement similar to, to tab six, although I would like it to be crafted, I, I would suggest we craft it a little differently with more of a general expectation for board members on conflict of interest and maybe a couple steps of procedures. If we have a question, here's what we do to follow, follow through with that. I think it also should be written in a language that um, are, is widespread, a wide range of, of readership can digest this uh, type of form and it's very clear and concise. Is that a motion? Go ahead. Yes, I move to make that as a motion. Yes. And I'll Thank second you. it. Any more discu any discussion on? Yeah, I, I wanted to just raise, um, there's additional tabs here that look to be um, some ethics policies that the Miami's Children's Trust used. And in it, there's some very plain language about expectations as to what board members can and can't do or what board members should and shouldn't disclose. And I wondered if we, as a board, were going to propose a conflict of interest or ethics policy, and wouldn't then this form be part of that policy so that we could look at the language, discuss the content, make sure it's plain language, and go from that perspective as opposed to just presenting a form but actually talk about having a policy for the board. I, I think we, we talked about it briefly at our bylaws committee that we probably need a policy manual. And this would be one of the things that as we, we develop, you know, I think that I noticed that several of the trust boards had policies in addition to their bylaws that would deal with, 
you know, who can vote when, um, um, and all of those kind of things that are the day-to-day -day operations. And so, yeah, I, I think th the full development of a conflict of interest policy with all of these things would be good. I agree with that. Any more discussion? So just to be clarified, the motion is to make a conflict of interest form and then with the plain language, with, a, with, a, with policies maybe later. Did we amend that motion or not even amend it? Did you want to amend the motion so that it includes a policy? As a friendly amendment, yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. Second. Our amendment procedure says there's no friendly. You just have to make an amendment. <laughs> Second. So, yes, I move that the form be rewritten so that it's in plain language but be supported by a policy developed by the board to cover all conflict of interest and in voting issues. Okay. Second. All in discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so we'll make, and so I would move that with the bylaws committee possibly get back together to come up with that. Is that okay, bylaws committee? Okay. It, would it be possible to ask Ms. Rogers um, to be able to attend that meeting? It would be helpful to have somebody with the legal expertise with that, I think. She, <laughs> she's smiling. <laughs> yeah. We, we can have somebody there. Okay. <laughs> okay, do we need to make a motion or that? No. Okay, all right, let's move forward. Okay, next, oh my, I lost my minutes here. Um, our next agenda, election of a treasurer. So the statute says that we, or the statute doesn't say we have to have a treasurer, but the statute, but, we, but we've decided, well, we think we need a treasurer. Also, the budget committee needs to have a treasurer. So I would make a motion, or may, I would make a move that we would have a treasurer for our trust. That was a long, colluded way I think the that. bylaws already say that we have a treasurer. The bylaws do say that. We just have an elected one, yet. yes. <laughs> so we need to elect a treasurer. Madam Chair? Yes, ma'am. I haven't asked him yet, but I'd like to nominate Dr. Smith, because he has a business background, and I don't, I don't, I, I think that this person doesn't actually do the books. They're just the chair of the finance committee, correct? Let's look at the bylaws. And the, what the bylaws basically say, we're going to have to hire a CFO. Yes, to actually well, do. preside over the CFO <laughs> Children's Trust. If Dr. Budget. Smith accepts, I'll, I'll second it. Yeah. Is there any discussion on Dr. Smith? What, did he accept? I will accept. Oh. Okay. Any discussion? All in favor of Dr. Smith as a treasurer? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, congratulations, Dr. Smith. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good, we're moving right along. Okay, number four, discussion on legal services. So at the last committee, uh, last meeting on April 27th, um, Ms., um, Ms. Hightower asked that, um, gave, asked that for Patty, for Carolyn and I to discuss legal services. So we have been meeting, we have been discussing, uh, we've come round and about, round and about. So this is where we finally are. We can um, need to we can proceed with an RFP request for proposal for to have our own attorney. We have to have criteria for that. We have to have a scoring, which make we have to advertise it. We have to, um, and that goes back to that website. We have to talk about the website for that, and we need another lovely committee to do all that work, unless we want to do it all together. Um, in the meantime, we um, have talked about having an interlocal agreement with legal on legal services with the county. Um, just through September 30th, or you know, until we can get an, our, our our own attorney in pursuit. Yes, ma'am. Madam Chair. Yes. Um, I have past experience with Chapter 287, uh -huh. and my memory was that there's an exemption for legal services under Chapter 287, which means you don't have to procure it through a competitive procurement. Uh, and I think that was specifically set up to allow. Uh, for it not to be a cumbersome environment to retain a legal service. I certainly would be corrected if, I stand, if I'm wrong, but that was my memory of that statute. Just so it's, you're aware that it may not be a cumbersome process. Okay, well we, we wanted to make it 
we want to be transparent and fair and open it up to whoever, whatever attorney would like to do, would like to do it. So we've talked to Michelle Watson, we've talked to the county, we've talked to the city, we've talked to the procurement office, and this is where we. But that's wonderful that you that we did we did not hear that one. <laughs> so, <laughs> Judge, what do you need to say? I think I just had a question. Though. Yes, ma'am. Did you say that you had come up with an agreement with the county? We have not come up with agreement oh, yet, okay. but that's that that is an option oh. to talk to to pursue an interlocal agreement with the county until we have we have put it on the website to advertise for our own attorney and which firm wants to take to take part in that. So that's where we are. Any other comments on that? So my my, my, my suggestion, I move that we would need to start a subcommittee to look into hiring an attorney and doing either the 287 and doing the exemption for it or figure out if we want to do an RFP to, allow, to make it open and transparent so any, any law firm can request. Not to be part of that committee. <laughs> I was going to make you chair. <laughs> Madam Chair, is there a in your motion or your idea for a motion, is it include the an interim solution prior to that? Is the interim that, solution is to work with the county to with for the county just attorney local support, agreement. legal services, right? Support. For legal services, wait. So we really need an attorney right now to help us with the trim process. Yes, and that's and that's that's what we really need for it. Also, to answer questions like we've asked Ms. Rogers several questions now already. So, we really need and to help with all the paperwork for trim process because it's rather large. Do you know? the potential duration of that interim support because if it could last till an executive director is established and that person be able to hire and recruit an attorney it just That's seems a lot cleaner but I don't know if the county is willing to support us for several months because I, I, I think that when we were meeting prior that the the question was and commissioner may you you being part of that that conversation on both sides um, as I look at this agreement, it, this would be a contract where funds would be expended. So um, I guess my question is, um, if we decided to contract through an interlocal agreement with the county for legal services, um, is this document something that was proposed that we would uh, do, or is this something as a, a model? I have not seen this document. This was the first time I've seen it. I didn't okay. put the document together. I think okay. Ms. Rogers put okay. the document on it. Because I, I can't remember from the conversation the commissioner yeah, said. Yeah, I had nothing to do with the document, no. Yeah, with, whether we would be charged or not. Right, yeah, no. Yeah. Okay. I've not been a part of a document at all. Okay. It's true. I brought the document, distributed <laughs> one to each of your workstations, I prepared a very rough draft of an interlocal on the request of Ms. Appleyard to, if I could do something like that for this evening. That is literally the Alachua County mm -hmm. interlocal, but with some of the words exchanged for Escambia County and some of those other little details that are unique to Escambia County inserted in there. The figures that you see are the figures that are in the interlocal uh, in Alachua County. So I, I'm i not saying one way or the other whether those are even close to appropriate or whether or not a figure is even necessary. This is just the Alachua County version. And I also have no idea how the Board of County Commissioners feels about any of this other than the board has voted to allow us and our administrator to provide services for the foreseeable future and they've waived any conflict of interest for us that that may raise. So even if you all voted to go forward with a certain interlocal, it still would be, you know, in that case, it's a three-party agreement with the clerk of their court. Um, so any interlocal- well, Madam Council, we have uh, agreed and voted uh, for legal and administration to provide support staff. We have done you, that Yes, we have pretty broad uh, support from the board in their vote to provide you know, all sorts of things, office supplies to the extent necessary, reasonable support from administration, administrative staff, um, you know, Zanani's here this evening, my staff. Yes, we have support by board vote to do that for the foreseeable future. And, 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 and Patty, I had not seen that document. And so I... I that is true. You yes. know, I... I literally have, have, have not seen it and 
uh, I misspoke when I was talking about Clark Partington on, on with, with, with Will, but I do agree with my colleague on, on the end that uh, as Carolyn transitions with the CEO, uh, that they have the opportunity to pick their team to fail or to succeed. And so I think that Allison and our staff is more than equipped. I mean, they wrote the Ortons, they wrote the Interlocal. Uh, she has a staff that's in place. Uh, she's eager to do it, has a passionate staff. So I don't really, I mean, I don't disagree uh, with my colleague uh, at the end if that's what you want to do. Madam Chair, I think that was just my, that's where I think where my confusion lies because I thought they were already doing that. And I didn't know if there had been a change that now required money that we haven't got <laughs> yet. <laughs> Madam President. So is this saying that this is the counter of a Alachua? This is what they were doing on the, in the interim before? Mm -hmm. And so yes. since they were doing it on the interim, this is an example of them moving forward to do it as long as it needs to be done, right? That's what we're... So that's, well, that answers my question that we have an example of what was already done by another county. Right. I think it's great. I think it was a multi-year arrangement. I mean, I think that the Alachua County BCC staff and the Alachua County Attorney's Office both have served in the capacity of support on contract basically for the trust for at least a couple two three years at they, they only started in 18 so uh, in two, their, two in three their, years yeah um, I I mean I, I'm not that familiar with the Alachua yeah. Trust I, I know that they were having some conversations about whether to continue that yeah. relationship or to right. go out with other ideas about who would serve them the other part of this that we haven't discussed is, if, you know, because we just looked at this, but this talks about provisions for payroll services, which, you know, um, as we move forward with an executive director, we will have a need for that. So I don't know whether, whether um, we just, have you had any conversations, Ms. Appleyard, about payroll or with the county or, because I know we're not paying you, I'm sorry. Okay. We can bring that back shortly. Personally, I think if the county has allowed for us to continue and if with promises that we are working on it, we need to get to trim with experienced staff. Yeah. Then it will be the next thing. All right. Yeah, I agree with yeah. um I, I agree with uh, Mrs. Appleyard. I mean they do it every day. I mean and Avalorm and millage rates and <laughs> trim notices and so um I don't think there's anyone better equipped in Allison's office to do it. And, and, and I certainly think once we hire uh, staff, Patty, uh, we certainly have to have our own payroll company. I mean, once we get funding, but at this point, we might even vote it on, you know, the bank, the income, and those type of things. Okay. One other, qu one other quick question. Um, do we need to have any kind of a, a an agreement that says that the county is doing these services for us? You don't have to have a written agreement. Okay. I think at the minimum, it does make some sense that there at least be a, a vote of the trust for at least, at least for the legal piece of it, mm -hmm. I would think for ethical reasons for the attorney that it helps to at least have it memorialized. It's a two-way street. The, the county commission had to agree to allow us to do this but it's a bilateral thing. I'm not necessarily someone's attorney unless they say they want me to be their attorney. So I, I think, it, and, and it's same for administrative staff as well, I do think it makes sense at a minimum that there be a vote to memorialize what the relationship is for everyone involved. It makes, I think, better sense to do it that way. And just as a, I know, I don't wanna to get too much in the weeds, but in the county structure, it's actually, payroll is actually under the clerk of court. It's not under the BCC. So just that may help also. I see that in that case, the clerk was doing the auditing and all that kind of stuff. In, in Escambia County, it would, if you got to the point of needing payroll and those sorts of services, they're actually under the clerk. So but we do, we, we do have precedent, Madam Council, HRC, PDC where yes. payroll comes from Landrums or Blue Arbor and they're still legal provided by county. I mean, we never separate payroll with the county. I mean, we never combine payroll with the county. That's a separate entity. 
because we'd be <laughs> right, contracting just, to you. We'd be contracting with you, whether it's contracted for pay or just contracted for I'm not necessarily talking about me yeah. so much as I mean, like in the future, if the trust has its own staff, right? It, if you're, and it it is possible to ask that they be allowed on county benefits, county HR, that sort of oh, thing. Oh yeah, that's like possible. Housing, yeah, like the housing yeah. trust fund. Correct, yeah, correct. That's true. But I, yeah. it would require yeah. the clerk's participation yeah. as well. I because we're on the legal discussion, I would be willing to make a motion that we as the Children's Trust, um, what's the word I want, uh, accept the, <laughs> the um, county's provision to provide legal services and uh, support. Right. That cover so everything? Moved. Second. Second. All in Ma any discussion? Chair? Yes. Madam Chair, I, and I certainly support that um, school board member Hightower. Uh, but even in the recruiting and what Carolyn's going to have to do, uh, one of the reasons with our, our, our housing trust fund and, and many it, it back in neighborhood enterprises, uh, the reason that it made sense for payroll through the county is because of benefits to be able to attract employees. And so sometimes independent payroll companies don't provide the type of insurance and retirement benefits that allows for you to, to recruit the best employees. And I'm not saying we need to do that, but certainly would love for legal and Carolyn to explore uh, all of uh, the options on employment so we can recruit the best people. Mr. Peden. Yes, and, and I appreciate the, the county's willingness to help. And, but I do think when um, Madam Attorney and, and the other staff, they didn't necessarily sign up for this. And so the board appreciate the county and I want them to be involved, but I think we ought to look at their compensation in some type of formality for, for, for your time tonight and, and uh, for Allison's and if they want to turn that down. But I, I, I don't know, I guess when you get hired, it's always that little line under all other related duties. And then maybe that falls under that. But I, 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 want, to, <laughs> um, I, want, to, I want to recognize that, that you know, things change and, and a lot of work they've got their own jobs to deal with mm -hmm. but if, if there's a way to compensate them and have it more formal i'd be for that and that could be something we can explore if the, if the board is willing i i agree yeah i i, I like that idea because this is yeah. not if i may um my board has said it's okay for me to be here and that would include my staff mm -hmm. i think this arrangement that alachua county has would be paying the county for the time of their staff and resources, not the individuals who were there. So it's essentially reimbursing the county for the expense that they have for keeping us. So it would not be to the well, individuals. Well, I think that's what he meant. I don't think he meant to pay And, and I'm not saying that, that, that our board has not discussed that that's necessary. I'm just saying that this is one of the ideas that's, that's out there. And again, I think just point of clarification, we're not talking about adopting this in a local agreement. We are just talking about memorializing the county's involvement mm -hmm. in the legal service. Right, exactly. Right. And before we take the vote, I feel the need to just, just disclose that, quite frankly, I feel like by very essence of being assigned to this board, I'm going to be disclosing for a while my relationship with the county if the county appears in front of me in a lawsuit. But I. At this point, I think the damage is done whether I vote or not, as far as that goes. And so <laughs> I, I do plan to vote. But again, the county may likely appear in front of me in proceedings. Wow. <laughs> is there any more discussion? Okay, all in favor of the motion by Ms. Hightower in the second? Aye. Aye. Okay, any opposed? Okay, so that passes. So thank you, Ms. Rogers and your staff for helping us. Okay, next, um, finance discussion. Madam Chair, if I yes, can, sir. I've got a question real yes, quick sir. on what we just voted and approved and all that. Will the uh, letter or whatever, the memo of agreement or memorandum of understanding, whatever that memorializes it as we just voted to do come before us so we know we're aware of what it actually looks like and says or is it basically going to be the prior? No, it's not going to be this. Document? No, no, sir. It's going to be just that we. I don't know. I, if we I think it would just be reflected in the minutes that we did this. Okay. 
All right, finance discussion. Under finance, we have bank, director and officers, insurance, and budget. So, um, Carol and I also have met and talked about banks, and once again, we want to be transparent. We want to let every bank who wants to be, uh, be our bank and hold our money to have an option to do that. We did learn that public funds, um, that there's a requirement that the money must be securitized, so that requires some different banks so, um, than other banks, and we have to have a request for proposal, a request for, um, yeah, proposal to do all that. So, all that being said, we kind of need a subcommittee. And we were going to let Mr. Um, Dr. Smith be in charge of the banking and the administrative subcommittee if he would like to help do an RFP and pick the bank. So, yeah. So that's the discussion on the bank issues is that there's, Ma I mean, there's a lot to choose from. Madam Chair, before yes, we leave this agenda item, I know that's that committee is a very appropriate thing to do. Um, just as a reference point or point of information, in the Leon County meeting we had last Thursday night, which was the original organizing meeting, mm -hmm. we um, voted as a board to allow the chair to meet with the county to establish a letter of credit, which would provide funding to the trust okay. that would have some ability to then have some finances to work from. Um, I think if I remember the TREM discussion, if we choose to go forward with TREM this summer, the revenues could come in this fall. If we choose to go forward with TREM next summer, they wouldn't come in until next fall. Right. So there's still a time gap between now and whenever that would be. And I thought this might be a good item to, to raise that. If you, if you have or haven't had that discussion, I didn't see anywhere else on the we agenda have, that yes. it would be. Thank you for reminding me. So we did, Carolina had to talk about line of credit. You know, if the county is, is willing, we could do a line of credit. Now, we don't really need much money right now. I mean, we, we talked about attorneys, but we don't have to pay for the attorney right now. And we have staff that's volunteering themselves. And so we really just need you know, so we don't we don't really need much money right now, until we get our millage, until we get our. Yeah, that was the. It was when you start pushing things out like RFPs and other things. Right. There might be mail costs. There might mm -hmm. be inbound costs. Right. There maybe things the county doesn't want to absorb. That if we had a line of credit for that would give us some flexibility. And one of the discussion points is the reimbursement of that line of credit and how long it could be, <laughs> because you don't want to have it dependent on revenues coming in this fall because it actually forces your hand if you do that. So if it's a, if it is a line of credit and if it's a small one, maybe it could be re reimbursed next year as opposed to the current year. This is a discussion. Um, I, I guess we would have to um, make a motion to ask the County Commission. Um, there was a discussion with the County Commission earlier uh, that did not go well. Uh, <laughs> so uh, that's. <laughs> well, that, uh, and, and that was for a large amount, correct? Well, yeah. Well, it was for two hundred and fifty thousand. I think. I don't think we need. So I mean, yeah. I think that now much. if you go, if we go, if we go to the budget part, maybe that well, answers right. the question. Well, question. Yeah, I'm, I, I think. In, 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 in school board member. When we say that the conversation didn't go well, it, it went the same reason that many organizations come to us and say, hey, give us a quarter of a million dollars, and we don't have a budget. I mean, we don't. Um, what, what's the line item? I, I think that if there was a realistic budget that came uh, before the commission saying exactly how those funds would be utilized, I, I think it, it could fall, you know, on supportive ears. And, but, I mean, to blanket, uh, to pull a number out of the sky and say we need $250,000 was not going to be supported by me and mm -hmm. and certainly my colleagues expressed that as well so I, I think if you had that budget uh for how it's going to benefit the community uh you probably would find uh some attentive ears i can't speak of how anyone would vote uh, uh but uh, as my colleague on the end has just said that you know uh, how how it's repaid and uh, at the end of the day, you're not borrowing from anyone but yourself because it's all taxpayers' mm -hmm. dollars. So I, I, I think if we gave our executive director the opportunity to somewhat put together a 
uh, budget, and as chairperson has said, uh, it's a much different than the anticipated budget of what we thought we were going to have initially in, in terms of uh, expenditures. Right. And if we meet the July 1 deadline, we should be getting our our funds what November December time frame absolutely so you know it's only it's already May so and we don't have many many funds right now to expend because we have attorney and staff basically given to us already so right um, so I mean if, if, madam executive um, to me madam chair and I'm only speaking for the guy that sits uh, at the end by the door for <laughs> exit purposes uh, if she could come back with a, a budget I mean I, I I would bring that forward to the county commission, but I'm open to any funding sources that you want to do. Okay, and so I would move that we would let Dr. Smith establish a committee to work on either a line of credit, to work on a budget, and to move forward with the budget, the directors and officers, and, and the DNO insurance. Um, Amy Lavoie, who was with the county and now is head of finance at the city, has an RFP for insurance brokers that she just did, and she's going to offer to give us that. So I would offer to ask to let Dr. Smith set up a committee to work on all three of those things. Have you given him any other people besides? No, we have, we have, we have, we have, we have no. That's the next thing. We have, we have to have, we have to do the next thing. <laughs> so, um, would anyone like to? be on Dr. Smith's committee. I'll, I'll serve with Dr. Smith. Okay, and I'll be on there and Tori. Thank you. Is there somebody else down there? David, David. David. And also, do you have that, present, that slideshow presentation, Janice, that I put together? <gasps> there it is. Okay. This is perfect. I did this this afternoon at like 3.30. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, okay. So, do we need a motion for a subcommittee? Probably so. For the bank, the bylaw says you have the ability to appoint them. Well, okay, is this well, not the finance plan. It is, one? yes. Okay. Um, so now we don't need a motion for that. No. So okay. So also on the budget, I wanted to talk about. I wanted to go through because we keep talking about the trim process, the trim process. We have to budget July first. So the statute. Whoever's clicking is doing a great job. Thank you. <laughs> the statute says on or before July first of each year that we should, we must, shall must prepare a tentative annual written budget of the district's income and expenditures. That's the first thing. The second thing we have to do is compute a proposed millage rate within the voter cap approved cap necessary to fund the tentative budget, and comply with the provisions of the mill of the trim and relating to the method of fixing millage and shall fix the final millage by resolution of the council. So next slide. Okay, so by July 1st, we have to determine a tentative budget, so we have two months for that. And we also have to determine the millage rate within the voter cap, which is a half mill. And then on July 1st, the property appraiser certifies a taxable rate value, and those are the statutes that said that. And then within 35 days, we have to fill out the trim forms and submit that to the property appraiser. So we have to determine the tentative budget, and number two, determine the millage rate that we're going to use. We can choose up to a half mil. We can choose another percentage, like a fourth of a mil, and increase the amount in the later years. So as I've been working with Carolyn this week and just kind of thinking the chicken versus the egg, we can either make a budget and then determine the millage rate, or we can determine the millage rate first and then the budget from there. My inclination, and I'm just one, one person, is to determine the millage rate first and then the budget. OK, next slide. OK. So, as it says, a taxable property value in the millage rate chosen will determine the budget for the trust. So, in 2019, I got all this from the Chris Jones, a property appraiser, and it's not correct, blue, blue, blue book form judge, so don't, don't judge. Um, the 2019 taxable property value rate was $18 billion. A half mil of that is n about $9 million, not taking into account early payment on collectibles, and a quarter of a mil is $4 million. And that what in 2020 it shows you what it is. So it's about about eight eight, eight billion, million dollars would be the budget if we did a half mil. So my recommendation is and you can do the next slide, is to go ahead and choose what millage we're going to do so we can choose a budget. And I just this is this came from Chris Jones as well. Um, is a, a man named Bubba. Peters, yes, thank you. Um, he helped to fill this out. This, this example, if we choose a half mil, if we're going to say if we're going to choose the half mil, it show, breaks it down what the average in 2019 the residential taxable value was per district, and the average annual residential ad valorem tax increase. So in District One, 
the average person who owns a house would pay an additional $35.41 per year for a half mil for the trust. So that's all I have on my slides. Um, thank you. <laughs> but I'm, I just, I've, I've been getting so, I, you know, when you get so much bombarded at you, they're just gonna make it simple. We have to have a budget by July 1, we have to choose the millage. So either, and so we need to, those are the two things we've got to figure out by July 1. That's all I have. Um, so if we want to make a, you know, discuss millage tonight on the budget so Dr. Smith and his committee can move forward and figure out, okay, we're going to go by $8 million, we're going to do $4 million, what it's going to be in our trust starting, starting November. Madam Chair? Yes, sir. Um, because millage wasn't agended, oh. I don't know that the public would know to be here to okay. have a public discussion on millage. Budget was agended. Budget was. It. So I would just coach us to stick Hold to budget tonight okay. because that's what was on the agenda and that we maybe have an agenda item on the next meeting that's labeled okay. millage so that the public knows that's going to get discussed. Gotcha. Okay. Madam, Madam Chair, I, I would like to um, just reiterate or, or um, follow up with your comment about the millage being determined first than the budget mm -hmm. so which i think is i'm thinking that doesn't impede on this agenda but um, right. I, I would just I, I think that makes a, a good financial approach no, I appreciate right. I think we should miss rogers just don't want you guys to get too far down the road know. number one the statute does specifically say that the council shall compute a proposed millage rate within the voter approved cap necessary to fund the tentative budget. So that makes it sound like you need a tentative budget to know what you're trying to fund. The other thing is to set millage, it's very specific statutorily, right. very specific. So that's even if you put it on an agenda that's not going to be sufficient enough mm -hmm. to set the millage you can certainly right, have very have vague have conversations them. about it but we got to have public hearings and whole nine yards right you know, but i mean literally what the resolution. chairperson said madam council makes a lot of sense she she's she said a 0.5 millage right a, a, a half a mil right. a quarter of a mil and then we could direct our executive director to bring back two budgets without us voting uh, voting upon it. We already have a needs assessment, I mean, because we've got to have that. And then as uh, has been stated, then you can have that conversation, but at least she's putting the conversation out there with our options. And so you can work toward two different budgets saying, you know, in the executive director can bring that back. And but so- I don't uh, disagree. But, yeah. I don't disagree at all. I just want to make sure you all understand your statute specifically says to fund your tentative budget. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's- Whichever one we so choose. Whichever one she chooses. Whichever one we so choose. I mean, so, she can bring back three so budgets. What, what I'm hearing Ms. Rogers say is that if, if we decided to go with a 0.5, then we make a budget that spends 0.5. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. Or, or if, if, if we go to a quarter, a half, that's I mean, whatever we decide. Madam Chair, I don't think that, I think that's the opposite of what Ms. Yeah, Rogers I think said. what I heard was that a budget is presented and then we have to determine the millage rate that will fund that budget. We don't go from, we need $10,000, so show me a $10,000 budget. We look at our budget, what is that number, and then what millage rate supports that. And if it's over the half mil, we have to go back to the budget, budgeting process and say, nope, too big, okay. got to go back down. Can't fund that with a half mil. I, and, and I understand that, that that that's what she said. And I guess the I we know that we have a lot of need in our community. And I think it, it's going to, you know, I feel like we've got to realize that we have a lot of need, and we're going to have a lot of upfront costs this first year in trainings, getting our community trained. The 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 grassroots organizations understanding how to access the money we have. Um, so, you know, I, I guess creating the budget is, is you know, we're going to have to have 
those pots that they talked about at the needs. I watched the meeting. Um, and, and, you know, can it be as simple as we've got three pots and we're going to put X number of dollars in each pot? You know, or do we have to have something more specific than that? Do you know? <laughs> well, a, a budget can be submitted in a line item fashion or it can be presented as, as, a, as more of a whole pre presentation. So it depends on how discreet you request the budget to be submitted. So I think that's up to our committee to determine how discreet. Obviously, there's a fourth bucket, which is called overhead, um, <laughs> that would need to absorb some funds as well. Um, so yes, I, I think it just depends on what the committee comes up with, how discreet the budget is. I think each one of us will look at what's presented and say, I either need more information to know what's in this line item, or it's, or it's plenty of information. Um, from someone who did contracting for 24 years, a cost reimbursement budget can be extraordinarily difficult to present and to support with line item definitions. W tell me about that travel line item. What does that include? How much mileage are you paying? How much hotels are you paying? How much conference travel is it? I mean, you can get very discreet in a budget narrative. So it sort of depends on what the committee comes up with and presents to the board and do we need to be more discreet or not more discreet in our determinations. It may be enough for what's presented or it may not be enough. M Madam That's why Chair. it's good that it's May. May, it actually May. I think it's more of a guesstimate than an estimate. I think because we don't have any historical knowledge of, of what things have cost. The only thing that our executive director can rely on uh, would be budgets from other municipalities and trusts uh, that have similar demographic issues, problems, populations that we have. And we probably would expect uh, that this board will be making amendments uh, to the budget uh, as we go forward. Uh, and so, I mean, any, any initial budget is just an educated hypothesis guess. And so I would say that uh, I would <clears throat> yield to our executive director to come back to us with some realistic numbers and, and, and costs that allows for us uh, to have uh, a conversation about uh, with, with knowing uh, that it won't be exact, that it would probably will have amendments at some point. I would like to just ask a question about the time frame of the budget. If the monies are coming in and the, I think it was November, if I remember correctly, is when the revenues would come. Is this a November to October budget, a November to June budget, a November to September budget? I'm, I don't even know our fiscal year, if that's been to, defined. Is that statute, Allison? What's our fiscal uh, year? No, What's our, our, it's our bylaws. It's in our bylaws. It's in our bylaws. Yeah. September, it's October that September 30th? Yeah. October, it's the same as October the to September 30th. Yeah. Same as so that would be the budget it's would be in October to September? I think that's we go under, right. And then I mean, Dr. Smith could, in his committee, could, you know, make two budgets. We could do one, they could do one for the interim and then one for once we get our funds. Madam President. I understand what, what has been said already, but I want, to add, well, I want to request, can we look at page two of what you submitted one more time, please, oh. before we leave this issue? Yes. Can we do that? Sure. I don't have the, <laughs> the power to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Next one. With the, with the uh, chart on it. Yeah, that one. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, Madam Chair, yeah, that's a, well, even, even though the uh, projected Avalon return in District 3 is low, um, they did vote for this tax at 90% versus some of the others, so. You're reading my mind, uh, Mr. Uh, Commissioner. I'll probably see why. You're reading my mind. Hmm. Okay, so well. for the budget, just in the finance discussion, Dr. Smith is going to determine, help come up with the budget, and bank do you know insurance and we'll meet and by our next meeting we'll he'll have a report to give us and, and, and madam chair i would hope and dr smith uh to, to me i mean as a rule of thumb i mean we do a contingency at the county i don't know what they do at the school board of about 10 percent i think knowing the unknowns that you know that you know there should be at least a 15 percent contingency uh with the ability for reallocation uh after we get 12 or 24 months in uh, because, I mean, I think that that would be good stewardship. Uh, and to, there, I think the statute specifically says, I read somewhere, but I can Well, it's a statute saying, so maybe I didn't read that. Well, it says, it didn't say how much contingency, but it says contingency, I believe. 
I mean, I, I think our standard rule, it's 10%, correct, Madam Attorney? Well, maybe we go 15. <laughs> yes, Ms. Rogers. There, there is a provision that your chair and anyone else on your organization who's going to have the authority to write checks needs to have a surety bond. That can be paid for by the trust, but they are obligated to have a surety bond in the amount of $1,000 for every million dollars of the annual budget. So just heads up, that's going to need to be folded in to your expected expenses. All right. Thank you. All right. Any more discussion on finances and or budget? Madam Chair, if I can just uh, make sure I have this correct, the, we will meet as a sub as a committee and um, report back at our next gathering here. Right. And do you want to go ahead and make a date for the? Yes, that would be great to do that. When's our next board meeting, Madam Chair? June. No, May 20th. May 20th. Yes. May 25th. Wow, we're gonna all become great friends. But then the next one's not for a month, and then they're a month out. Praise God. I know. <laughs> I'm looking for a date. I just okay. can't. You're fine. <laughs> My calendar's. Up. If we need to come back. We later, can come. We, we can, can come back. We can come back and do that. Um, CEO process, Ms. Appleyard put this on the agenda. <laughs> She's worked very hard the past two weeks. Um, so we do need to start looking, or we, you know, if y'all want to, a discussion, do we want to start looking now for a CEO? Do we want to wait till after July 1st? We need to have a job description, a timeline process, criteria. Um, you know, if, if Madam Appleyard can start putting it together, I mean, I would expect that even after we hire someone that she'd be on for six to 12 months, getting them, I think the sooner the better uh, to get uh, our um, person in so they can build. I mean, what I would like to do is hold the executive director responsible. And with that, I want the executive director to build their team. So if they fail or if they succeed, they succeed with what they choose. And so I'm... I mean, my, my vote um, to allow for her as she's bringing budget and looking at other job descriptions to bring it back and a recommendation on timeline and process from Ms. Appleyard. I'll second that um, because I, I, I think we've had, we had a lot of information presented from Ms. Watson with all the different executive director job descriptions. So um, I think we could put one together with the timeline and you know I, that leads into to what Mr. Sachs said about letting them create their team, the legal services, right. and anything else that we need. So um, I, I'm for that, because if that's possible by the 22nd to bring that back, or is that too soon? Why don't we do that one by June? Madam Chair, could I recommend maybe that you and the Vice Chair being and the Treasurer being the Executive Committee meet with the interim administrator to do that planning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fine. Right. Kind of we an executive, to, executive committee up. direction. Okay. And we'll find a date before we leave tonight for that. No, you mean separately? You mean yeah, separate. the sunshine? I'm yeah, no, no, no. Separate. In the sunshine. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but not, not with all of unless you want to come. Yeah, gotcha. um, okay. So we will find a date for that as well to meet. And maybe report back by June, the, the June board meeting for that. Or whenever you get Okay. Uh, right, by June. Um, Ms. Appleyard, Ms. Appleyard, you had a comment? I just, uh, is some direction on um, a search and if that's to be a funded search? I mean, it's just as we set up the budget, it may not be much, but that would be, that's going to be a question that comes up and we'll have to come back to you unless you answer it. I might recommend that the committee come back with that as part of the timeline. You know, the, there would be a cost to the to the budget if if we were going to pay for someone to travel in, or we're doing a national search. 
and those kind of things and the salary i guess too. and the salary yeah i mean all of that has to okay um report from needs subcommittee we had and anyone who was there yesterday can jump in we had a great meeting yesterday we heard from some wonderful providers and they just affirmed what why we're here and what we're doing um i know sean salamita was there from um from he's I keep saying FFM but he's not FFN anymore from um, from from Lakeview um, and we had just we had, the judge Dan Heiser was there we had helped the um, start we had a chief of Scambia was there we had we, we had some great providers who were there and just affirmed why we're doing what we're doing and, and it's excitement for it um, and we came up with three and we had to discriminate buckets pillars themes priorities whatever y'all want to call them but basically ready kids ready youth ready families and those are going to be our three priorities buckets. So I'll take, I mean, if you want to, I want to keep consistent language. So three priorities for the year. And we can reassess those, you know, the subcommittee can reassess that later on. Any other comments from the subcommittees? I think, uh, again, you summarized it very well um, and uh, described it well. Michelle participated uh, by uh, audio visual and suggested that we, uh, at least one way of looking at it, is these larger three to four generic uh, buckets, if you will, with the idea that then as we start getting the individualized needs and programs uh, that we're looking at funding, that the likelihood that they would fit in one or perhaps even more of those several buckets will allow us to provide at least an umbrella start to allow uh, Dr. Smith and others on his committee to begin formulating a budget what am I trying to budget for <laughs> uh, and that type of thing. So that uh, I, I think you did a stellar job of describing it. And I would agree with you that a lot of enthusiasm, I think, by Sean and the organization he represents and the others that were there as well. Madam Chair, I just want to thank you for your leadership on it. I, thought, I think it was a great meeting and uh, great dialogue and Superintendent Smith was there. So thank you. And I agree with the three buckets. So thank you so much. Could you state what the three yes. buckets are? They're ready kids, <laughs> ready children, ready youth, and ready families. And Dr. Smith, you did have a recommendation as well that we go back to the public for approval of those three. Yes, one of the, the recommendation that we, we came from uh, that meeting with was to uh, come up with a format perhaps using a web-based format where we can put out something with just a general overview with the, the three buckets, but really um, seeking approval or affirmation from our community and, and casting a wide net uh, really to just have people respond, we're on board with this or, or we have concerns. Um, and, and so really looking for affirmation from residents. And part of that, too, is we want to be very transparent. We want our residents to be involved with this, this process. It is our community's process and, and organization, so for, for the good of our children. So that's one of the pieces embedded in that um, reaching out to the community is to, to make sure we are hearing the voice of our community. I think uh, Tori also brought up the concept very appropriately in my estimation that to get where we are here and now, the public was already provided with a bill of sales of some sort, so to speak, and a description of things. And that part of what Dr. Smith has uh, I've described is an acknowledgement back out to the public that we heard you all. We are sincere in our efforts to align what we're doing with what you all were told as the voting public that led to where we are now. And here's where we're going to go as we're now starting to actually talk about real dollars and cents and expenditure of resources and those types of things that we are responding to the uh, approval that was granted to us uh, in the confidence that was given to us to put all of this together now and all. And that, that is what part of the notification, whether it be on the website or some other way I was looking on my uh, computer earlier and they had a nice mention of that already there mentioning those three already so somebody is very quickly um, I, I guess I need a, a, a clarification um, 
I, I did watch the, the needs assessment meeting, and um, I think these three items were part of the, the package that, that sold the referendum. Um, they were already on the website. These are the three that people bought into that, that they approved it. So when Dr. Smith says we're going to put it out and see if they're going to buy in, I'm kind of wondering, does that mean then we'll change what we're going to do? Or would it be more appropriate for us to, to do a, an announcement of this is where we are, these are the things that we're going to move forward with to announce to the community that, you know, if you're an organization out there that feels like you fit into a bucket, you know, be ready when we're ready to go. I, I, I'm just kind of reluctant to put something out with somebody with thinking that they're going to come back and change our minds. I, I, I just wanted a clarification on that. I think with our, with our recommendation, uh, first of all, we wanted to share it this evening. So we do have discussion about that because we, we certainly want to make sure what we're putting out is effective and efficient as well. Um, so I, I think we were looking at really a, a, a very centralized message of we're moving forward, here's, here's reiterating these three um, points and, and are you still supporting that as 61% of the voters had in the, in the referendum? Um, but that's a good point. I mean, if what happens if it comes back and no, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're kind of in a position there. <laughs> what, what, Jim, it's going to matter. What, what, it, it, listen, the, the die has been cast. The votes have been counted. Mm -hmm. The geographics have been presented of who passed this tax and who didn't. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and, and, and that's important to me. Uh, although I agree with Dr. North that, that it's for all of Escambia County. Yes. Uh, there was a collateral material and a targeted demographics of a systemic issue in which this committee presented to this community for funding and help. And so I, I think that uh, as we open it up, if we were to open up to have a large discussion, as you said, it passed 61%. Mm -hmm. But let me tell you, in my district, it passed 90%. In some districts, it only passed 40 or 50%. So if you go with my colleague that sits on the, in the north end, uh, it's anti-tax. And they would have horrible things to say about this social program that's coming forward. If you were to come to my district, uh, that, a district that has, you know, three or four, you all know, Title I schools, I mean, it would be uh, more receptive, but the expectations are a lot higher. And so I, I think that as we have this discussion, that we have to realize the, intended, the in, intent of why it was passed and understanding uh, that we are not going to be able to wipe this broad brush over this whole community and alleviate poverty, dysfunction, all those things, that I think that it has to be targeted. And quite frankly, uh, the messaging uh, and the promotion of passing this wasn't a targeted, uh, it, was, it was a targeted campaign, uh, without a doubt. Uh, and so I think that uh, the target uh, of how we present those resources has to be in line with where we target it to get the support. So I, I, I agree with you. I think at, at all times we should have input, but I don't want to get input to the way in which it disrupts uh, uh, right. what we're doing, because it can easily become a political animal of those who are anti. I mean, you can open up a public forum. I mean, you're talking 40% of the population going against a, something is a lot of people. I mean, they could cause a ton of disruption. So, and with you, I'm always about, you know, open government, uh, open uh, participation. But I do understand uh, that uh, not everyone is a stakeholder in this idea that we have uh, for the Children's Trust Fund. So I would just keep that in mind as we move forward in the community. What if we just did a press release and Ms. Appleyard is... Well, one thing I think we need to clarify is how, what the website is. Um, that's the, the next, yeah, that's number nine, yeah. And thank you to Achieve Escambia, wherever you are. Yeah. They are the ones that have kept it up. from their work to 
do the campaign, they got the website up, the Children's Trust website. Yes. It's pretty much been dormant mm -hmm. since, because I think, I don't know if this board asked permission how, how you do that, but somehow to take that framework, we need to update it. Mm -hmm. That will be a great place to put a message. They have other social media platforms. Um, press release, billboards, whatever you want to do with the time as we walk through this process. But first, I think we need to know we're working off their work so far. And so, I mean, ma Madam Chair, and, so, and, and, and Dr. Smith, I quite frankly concur with you and, and, and school board member. I, I, I think that we have to have citizen input of the services, although we presented that out, I agree with you. There has to be stakeholder, has to be dial sessions. Uh, we have to be in neighborhoods listening to people. And I don't know if that's as a committee or subcommittee or staff, but I do agree, or rather it's through the Mason Dixon that we talked about, or rather through the Hall Center. I think that we, as we make decisions, uh, we need to hear the voices of the people that are closest to the problem. So I agree that we have to make sure that that's there. We uh, tend to be on the same page tonight. It's amazing. Uh, well, Patty, we've always been on the so same page. <laughs> I, I don't know why. I don't know why you let people separate us. Uh, but 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 I I think that is that was where I, I, after I got the clarification because I think that what we need to do is we get this budget together. We've got our three buckets or however many, and then we go to the community for town hall meetings yes. to say. This is what we're doing. These are things that we th think would fit here, and, and mm -hmm. then that's where we're going to get. We have to go to the people. We can't expect. Yeah, them well, to we come go here. to the people. People are not going to come down here. I mean, yeah. if we're not in Oakwood Terrace, if we're not at CAYs, if we're not at Lincoln Park, the very things that we utilize. I mean, let me just tell you, and I, and I say this on the record, uh, when this was presented to us to go uh, uh, to the taxpayer. It was a bunch of African-American children on a flyer that they did the mail out, and they targeted those neighborhoods. And so if we're going to take their vote, we darn well are going to go back into the neighborhood to, to understand what at least they think is best for them. And so for me, we should do that. We, and, and I agree when uh, Mr. Northam is talking about moving meetings. Uh, let's go to the people who lack transportation in Pensacola Village. Let's have a meeting in their community center and go and listen to exactly what they say. And then it's up to us as elected leaders, or appointed leaders, to come back and formalize that uh, and to be able to present our program or, or, or our funding source to uh, help address those issues that, that they bring forth. So, Patty, we're always on the same page. I mean, we only, we, we I, only I had one disagreement. Commissioner, I better interrupt you while you're talking like that right now. So, we're blessed, some of us are blessed to live in that circle and to walk in that circle every, every day to talk and converse with the very people that we're talking about. I have, I'm, I'm smiling and laughing on the inside because that concern from, from the people that we are here to serve will not be lost. As long as I, for one, have enough physical ability to be, on, to be where I'm sitting now. We're going to remember that. That's, don't worry about that. We're going to remember why we're here, period, mm -hmm. and what we're supposed to do. Absolutely. That's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you. So back to, let's tie, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say we appreciate that. And that was, I think, mostly the intent rather than saying, here, try something, because we recognize we'd be going back and forth with that discussion all the time. But on the other hand, we did want to be brand new to this, so new, knowing that there are 40% of the population that is not sold on this at this point, that we're wanting to make sure and double sure that we're being transparent with this. And as Tori brought up, she used the analogy as you all that were there with her grandma, expecting to see you came to me and sold me a bill of goods, and now you all are starting to you know really implement that and operationalize it. And what y'all are doing is over here, and what you told me was over there. We've got a problem, and that's the intent. Is just to say we did hear you guys up front. We are making headway. We are trying to meet some of those community needs. And here's what we're doing, rather than asking so much for their individual approval so much at this point, so but good. certainly at all times asking for their input and how can we do what we're doing better and those types of things. So it's more just what we're, what we're going to do is just more do a press release, put it on the website, which we're going to get to discussion next. And that's what we're going to do for, for, our, for, for our, our priorities. And then we'll definitely go into the communities and have those town halls and hear from those. As she said, Achieve has done the work. Right, Achieve has um, done um, the work. We know what, what, right. they, what the issues are. Any more comments on the needs subcommittee? 
All right, let's go to the website real quick, and then we'll do public, one more thing, and then we'll do public comments. All right, website discussion. We gotta get. Go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to um, bring it up because I, I did hear some conversation about it at the needs um, committee subcommittee, and kind of as as a background, um, the committee, um, the chief of Scambia, put the website up. Well, well, the referendum team, I think, did that. And um, Achieve Escambia used, well, it's, I think it's off of their site, but they used um, campaign funds to keep it going, leftover campaign funds. Um, so um, some of the things that have been able to be uploaded there, like the minutes from our meetings and the notices of meetings, and I just really think that, um, um, I don't know how what the process is to get, uh, Carolyn Appleyard is the administrator, you know, to change it over so that it now it becomes our website that we put things on. Um, and and uh, as, as she has her, her sidekick now, uh, <laughs> that, you know, we can become, it can, it, it can be a source of information for the community. Um, so, uh, but I, I, I did hear some conversation and I didn't know whether everybody wanted to keep that one going or if somebody wanted to create a new one, but that would not be me. The judge. <laughs> Uh, just a point of clarification is that isn't there a cost associated with, with we this? Okay. Yes. Again, we yes. don't have the money. But yes, that's the budget. That's what we will have Dr. Smith and our team work his team work on. Um, but do we need to make a motion to allow Carolyn to be able to have access to that website, or do you already have access? Achieve's website. So Achieve has to. So can we re just request that Achieve continues to do that pro bono as they've done until we can get a budget? I I think they're not doing it pro bono. They're using um, leftover campaign funds is what I understand. Oh, they still have some more money. I mean, I'm, I'm good either way. I mean, it, it doesn't matter to me. I mean, but we don't have any money to allocate. I mean, I don't think we can authorize. We can't. We don't have right. a budget yet. Yeah, we so don't we have can. a budget. It could be a line item. Madam Chair, could we right. just ask Carolyn to meet with Achieve Escambia and see yes. if a... Uh, mutual agreement can be worked out so she has access to it and can represent the trust as the uh, runner of the or the admin of that website yes. and if they are uh, oppositional to that then we need to come back and address our own resources to have our own website right and I think they're not they, they don't have to yeah, achieve doesn't have an oppositional bone in their body <laughs> um, I just had to state it for the record that it might be a possibility <laughs> Okay, so we'll do that. Yeah, we'll hand it off. Um, we need to come back and do, we need dates for the budget committee and dates for the executive committee. Um, Madam Chair? Yes, ma'am. Just very quickly, speaking of you, the budget committee, you had talked about coming back in June, but I'm wondering if we already have the, are the um, sample job descriptions and we're, the budget's going to be meeting, can't we discuss May 25th at we, least? Part of what that, our yes. description and what our for the job, uh, yes. I just didn't will know be. if we okay. had Miss Alvin would have time between now and then to come up with everything that we needed to discuss. I have for the uh, finance committee. Is that what we're calling it? The finance committee. Finance with budget. Finance plan. Budget planning committee is what the bylaws say. Budget planning. budget planning committee. Thank you. For that, I have two possible dates to propose. Uh, Wednesday, May 19th at 3 o'clock in the afternoon or Monday, May 24th at 10.30 in the morning. We could, I believe we can host those at uh, school board. What's the, May 24th and what's the other one, Doc? Uh, May 19th. May 24th would be great. That works for me. Okay. May 24th. Except our meeting is the, the 25th. 25th, no, that's I fine. That's fine. We'll have time to report that. Okay, so May 24th. It's good with everybody. Monday, May 24th at 10.30 a.m. And, and then... And we can meet at the Hall Center, which is the school board office at uh, on Tahar. And then you also said the 19th. You said at 3 o'clock. Could we do that one for the executive committee meeting since you're open that day? 
Yes, we can arrange that, okay. that as well. Well, he's already open, so why, why find another date? <laughs> <laughs> well, we need to discuss the, 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 the job description, CEO process, so we'll go ahead and do that on the 19th. Okay. At 3 o'clock for the executive committee. If Tori's available. If Tori's available, right, exactly. But, Sorry, Madam Chair, I didn't mean to force your meeting. I was just thinking there was Well, no, we have to have a meeting. Yeah, that's fine. We No, we need to have the meeting, but we just, he told us that was a date. Okay. All right, public comments. We have... Mr. Washington. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I just want to say <clears throat> I don't have much time, so I was getting a little itchy, nervous. Got to pick up some kids. We have a tutorial program where the kids are getting out, and some kids getting out of basketball. So I got to pick some kids up and kind of keep it moving. But I would like to say uh, my name is Benny Washington. I have over 30 years of teaching and coaching experience. I uh, work for a nonprofit, uh, James B. Washington Education and Sports, and we have an academic tutorial program, and we have a basketball program. This program primarily deals with at-risk youth in the underserved community. Our goal is to increase graduation and to decrease uh, gains, incarceration, juvenile delinquents. And we've been doing this for three years. I just want to make sure that we are included uh, when things start going out. I've been trying to get with uh, Dr. Smith. I've called a couple of times, haven't been able. Ms. Hightower, I've spoken with you. Uh, and we're looking to go into the Warrington area, expanding to the Warrington area. We're on 2020 North Palafox. And we want a partnership with the Warrington Miller School, West Pensacola, what's, what's going over there. Now, what I see all the time is, it started in youth sports, and it's just one of the small problems. A lot of times these kids are playing sports. They're playing ball, football, baseball, basketball, ex excellent athletes. But the kids are playing with two and three Fs. And then by the time they get to middle school and high school, there's a grade point average requirement. We require 2.5 grade point average. Now, if they 2.0, we're still going to let them play. But by the time some of those kids get to Middle school and high school, they are academic and eligible. And then we're also seeing those kids, where well, they can't go to plan B, let's concentrate on academics, because a lot of them are two, one or two years behind academically. So those kids are dropping out of school, and it's kind of like that from the schoolhouse to the jailhouse. You know, kind of like from the you know, enslavement to mass incarceration. These terms people don't want to hear, it's really happening out there. And we're fighting this every day. Uh, and we have kids, but we don't have the funding. And I know some programs have the funding, but they don't have the kids. And they're not going into the Mars Coast and the Pensacola Village. And I know uh, uh, Commissioner May, he does an excellent job of doing that. But we need some help reaching those kids. And then trying to find a partnership to work with the school system at least in the summertime, uh, I, I would just like to lead this flyer where we have Summer Youth Enrichment Program, and that's the void, that summer slide with the kids. Keeping kids involved the first three hours, they're doing math, English, science, social studies. Then we're playing games, checkers, chess, dominoes, scrabble, uh, monopoly, games that make them think. Um, and we take them on all kind of field trips. You know, they might go swimming. We might take them to the zoo. We might take them to Mobile to the Science Exploratory. And we're doing a lot of things with these kids, and it's making a big difference. We've taken them to Tallahassee to the Capitol, Florida State, Florida a &M, uh, Alabama State. We're doing a lot of things, but when we got to get out here and kind of struggle, you know, with the finances, and these kids don't have anything. We can't get in the gym. They want to charge us $160 an hour just to practice. Uh, it's a lot of different things that's going on that we need some help with. Our organization is willing to jump in with both hands and both feet. We're doing it already. It's not like we're an upcoming new program. You probably don't know much about us because we're too busy working, and it's hard to get away. So uh, just take us under consideration. How you doing, Ms. Alpiard? I just appreciate any help that you can give us and how we can assist the community in any kind of way. Uh, we're here to be helpful. Uh, I don't mean to run out on you. If you have any questions, yes, sir. 
Uh, first, very impressive and appreciate your efforts and what you all are doing at this time. Thank you. Thank you for that. Do you have a ballpark, as you all have been doing this for several years now, of what your average kind of uh, participation or enrollment number is or how many kids you all are able to uh, care for right at this point? I understand you all have got limited funding. Yeah, at this point, uh, in the tutorial program, we have about 23 kids. Now, because of COVID, of course, we had to cut scale back, all right? And the basketball program, the basketball is kind of what's getting the kids. We go in some of these low-income areas, and I said tutoring the kids, not, they're not coming, but if I throw the ball out there, they come. And when they start coming, then we start checking grades. So we kind of use the software, we have a couple of tutors, and it's, we trying to raise money to pay the tutors. Everybody said do it for free. Uh, volunteer when they think a nonprofit we supposed to, we have overhead too we have expenses that we have to kind of take care of too so we probably have about a, over 100 kids in the basketball program 25 in the tutorial program but we only we got 1200 square feet that's the building that we are operating out at 2020 North Palafox I'm turning people away you know we used to use that excuse COVID COVID we can't have no more kids but things begin to clear up a little bit so now we can't accommodate it because we don't have the space. I have so many kids coming for tutoring now more than ever before. Um, and and I, I can take eight or nine kids at a time. We're doing it three days a week. But the need is there. Um, we just don't have the funding or the space. You know, the school board, I don't know if y'all got a gym or some of a school we can, that's closed down that we can kind of operate, and I'm not trying to start a school. I've done that, okay? Not doing that. It's an after-school program. And if these kids don't have something to do four or five days a week, two or three days of tutoring, two, two or three days of sports, if they just sit in their communities, in those low-income province areas, you have crime, you have everything you can think of, they're gonna get in trouble just sitting on the porch. You know, trouble just finding them. So we are being proactive. Now, there are a lot of dollars out there for kids, that are AMI kids, or kids that have been in juvenile detention, or people that have been in prison, and we're trying to, you know, uh, get them back on the right track. But for just a regular kid that, that want to do something, there's not much funding out there. Um, at least I haven't come across it. We haven't come across it. And I would just like you all to just take us under consideration. I have much more information for you that that I can give to you, sit down and talk. But we are, we are on the ground. And like I said, some people, they have the funding, they don't have the kids, and they call us, want us to bring our kids, and they getting the dollars, and you're gonna give us a Subway sandwich and a bag of chips. And that's not gonna get it, because we going in these areas where some people don't wanna go, and we making some leeway, but now everybody wanna come, and we need a bigger space. We need more funding to have more people. And I'd love to sit down at another time to discuss these things, but I gotta pick up some kids from tutoring and some kids from basketball. I mean, I, I, I thank, thank you, you for so the time. Much. Thank you all. And, okay. you'll, and you'll make sure the public will know when these requests come out. We'll have, we'll have a, a request for, for proposals for people like you to ask for money. So. We're not there yet. We'll get there soon. <laughs> so. I just want to get in on the ground floor, and I think well, I'm about five floors it. behind. <laughs> Coach White, and I appreciate you, and I love to hear All you right. talk, but I got about 80 or 90 kids in the gym right now, and they need to ride home, too, because right. I got to get out here and go pick them up. All right. right. Chair, it's Thank awesome. you so care. much, Thank Mr. You. Washington. All right. All right, Mr. Brown. Thanks, Coach. Right. Thank you. Mr. Brown. Good evening, Chairman White and to the board. Uh, full disclosure, Mr. May is one of my board members. I am the executive director of the Community Action Program. I'm Doug Brown. We are the grant. Full disclosure, Benny Washington started in my program about two years ago, so you're right. Now, you we've, uh, that's what we talked about. The, the tentacles are connections, so you're right, Doug. Thanks. We, uh, I'm thinking about what you all are doing. I've been a part of the discussion of the Children's Trust a couple of years ago when Bruce Watson brought it to the... Uh, to the, to the body at, a, I guess, an annual meeting, did it for a couple of years until it finally got traction. And as I was sitting here, I'm gonna write down, I wrote down a couple of things and I really wanna just talk about some of the challenges. 
I got here a document, and I'll make a copy and send it to whomever. This is annually what the Head Start program requires of every Head Start grantee. It's a program information report. It goes into every detail of every demographic you can track. The federal government is really, really good at that. We track it all. We know the number of kids. We know everything that we can about the families in this community. And we do that for 735 kids, zero to five, between here and Escambia, excuse me, Century. So when the gentleman was talking about the, the logo, the beauty of that logo was the county map in the middle of it. And if you think about the reach of kids from the tan yurts up to Century, the miles are vast, but the challenges are the same. Their opportunities have been determined by where they were born. So I'm thinking about equity, and you were talking about even serving. We have a board, and by federal statute, we're required to have a board that has low-income folks that serve. So they have a voice in guiding how we serve a community. We think hard about people that serve, and while three hours drive may be not a problem for a seasoned professional, it makes a big difference if you're in Century and you don't have bus fare and you want to serve, but you can't serve because you don't want to tell the people that you serve with that you're not financially in the same category as they are. So I say that as you're looking at this body of governance, you consider that finance has no indication of input value and intellect, and those individuals need a space to participate. So I implore you to reconsider options that allow that. So I'll continue. Low birth weights, I'm just going to go down a list because it's late. <laughs> Low birth weight, prenatal care, lack of prenatal dentistry, diabetes, asthma, behavioral health, behavioral health, behavioral health, behavioral health. Dr. Smith and the teachers know that behavioral health coming out of pandemic is a challenge and our solution is not the right one because we don't have enough practitioners for early education, so we add another person in the classroom so that teacher, the two teachers can teach the rest of the kids so that the kid with the behavioral issues gets the attention they deserve. But for that third teacher, that classroom doesn't get the educational experience that they need. But for the behavioral health professional, I don't need to be paying for a third teacher that's really not doing anything but watching a kid so I say that to say there's a need in this community, I think, for a deep understanding of the number of professionals that serve zero to five in the behavioral health space. We're in a crisis in this country. We're in a crisis in this county. I'm just telling you what we see. Second, and beyond second, beyond that, the number of teachers, Head Start nationally, has a requirement that your teachers have a bachelor's degree. And we underwrite that. We pay for that. We pay for that, and then we lose that teacher to the school district because we can't compensate them in turn with their peers. There's no institution, West Florida, University, University of West Florida, or Pensacola State College that are producing early education credentialed individuals. You've got to go to Troy. You've got to go to Niceville. You've got to go somewhere. So when you start looking at the realities of how we are dealing with this workforce issue, we're not creating it. We're bringing it from somewhere else and we're losing it to somebody else. It's a holding pattern. So if you want quality, retention is a need, which means we've got to pay better. So I'm going to pivot on a couple things because, again, it's late. The mill that you, the maximum mill you can produce is needed. One of the things that the gentleman spoke to is the need of the nonprofits that's nothing more than a tax designation. It's not a business strategy. It's a tax designation. He's got to pay Gulf Power for his 1,200 feet. That's not enough. And the dollars that he's getting to pay that is coming from who knows where. When he started talking about college trips, the dollars to pay for that is coming from who knows where. His mission is those kids. The pain for him is coming down here and having to explain that to you guys. And I say that with all due respect because I don't know the gentleman, but I know that story. So I say that to say, 
as you all are doing this, there's varying tiers of nonprofits that are going to come before you. Some of them, like me, got a multi-million dollar budget and I got a staff and I'm still in need. Still in need. And there's others who are on a shoestring and faith that are just doing good works and they don't have a balance sheet, but they know every kid and they know every mom and they need a process for them to get access to those dollars so that they can build their systems and be better competing for additional dollars. I don't know how you all do that, but if you don't do that, those that are in the weeds, in those communities where this was created to address, <laughs> unless you're giving those folks the resources to build themselves to, those communities are going to be, in effect, served by organizations that are nice folks, but don't know the community. So I say that to say, in this space of equity, in this space of all the things we've gone through as a country over the last couple of years, while you're doing this work, keep equity in mind when you're thinking about who you're hiring, who you're putting a contract in the hands of, because all of it matters to the folks that made this happen. Lastly, I'll say, there's a cadre of folks that worked for a long time. The Chief of Scambia was kind of probably the backbone of it. They're still there. If you need them, they're all willing to help. So I say that to say, you've got an advisory that's already there. They're invisible to you until you form them. I say that to say, community action has been here since 1965. It's hard as hell. I can't say it any other way. We work with zero to 75, 85, 95. We work with youth serving organizations, after school programs. We're funding those things. We're trying to create more. And we're just one piece to that. Facilities, 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 facilities. I said the last thing, I got to leave there. You can't tell a kid or you can't tell a parent that this is great and it's shabby and looks half done. If you want excellence, then provide excellence. I can't say that another way. Communities are tired of getting what's left over and said, now go to be excellent with it. That's just not right. So I say that to say, I'm passionate about it. I know you all are too. It's a long night, but we, are, we can't be tired. We can't be tired because there's some kids somewhere who but for this children's trust, but for Coach Washington picking them up and taking them home, ain't no telling where those kids would be. And there's too many that we can say we're sorry about. We can do more. Thank you. That's our last public comment for tonight, so I move to adjourn. Madam, Madam, Madam Chair. Yes, um, sir. In, in full disclosure, um, Doug and, and Benny are, are hangout friends of mine. Well, but as, as, as we move forward in, in policy, as I know that we're going to have those who oppose this and, and come, I would petition the chair uh, to have some type of uh, time limit and restrictions on, on, on public comment uh, for the orderly fashion of the meeting. Yes, sir. We can discuss at the next board meeting. <laughs> Madam Chair, I'm at, Madam Chair. No. No, I did not set a bylaw subcommittee meeting. Um, can we wait and we do, that wait. Do, that that do that the next time? Because you've got you've got We've lots got of lot meetings. And I think we'll, as we, as we go through these, these different discussions, we will find more things that need to go into policy, but I will start looking at the policies that already exist. No need in creating something that might, we can, might can just copy. <laughs> yes, Mr. Sachs. Madam Chair, as I mentioned in the last meeting, I will not be able to make the May 25 meeting, okay, but well, I'll be watching you from Orlando. Well, we appreciate all your insightful and what whiz, and you have very wise you comments. June. And tell um, Mickey we said hello. Yes. All right, so move to adjourn. So move. Okay. Thank you all. <laughs>